Hey, I'm Bert Wagner, and today we're going to talk about temporal tables. Have you ever needed to look at what data used to look like in one of your tables? Probably involved writing a query that used lots of group bys or nested subqueries, window functions, right, to be able to kind of get the right records at a certain point in time. No longer do we have to suffer with writing such complex queries. With temporal tables in SQL Server 2016, it's really easy to see what data looked like at a certain point in time. So how do temporal tables keep track of your data? Basically, we have two tables. The first one is your main table. It has the current view of your data. So this is the one that you're writing you know, all your insert statements to, your updates, your deletes, and it has the current state of all your values. That's known as the temporal table. When we create the temporal table, it also creates a second historical table, and that's where all of our row changes are kept track of automatically by SQL Server. In the past, you may have written triggers or stored procedures, or maybe your application itself kind of logged what it was doing uh, anytime it did an insert or update or delete. Uh, you no longer need to do that if you create the temporal table. SQL does that automatically. In addition to keeping track of your data automatically, it makes it also very easy to query your data for certain points in time without needing to do all those complicated queries. So let's just dive right in and take a look at an example of how to use temporal tables. Let's start by creating a car inventory table. I'm creating this table here because I am starting a car rental agency, right? Figure, let me get some cars, I'll run them out to customers, I'll make a lot of money that way. Um, the key thing is to kind of be aware of in this table what it basically what makes it a temporal table. So we need to have our primary key um, and an identity column here. Um, there's also two date time columns that we need that have these generated always as row start and row end properties on them. That's how SQL Server is going to keep track of when a row existed in our temporal table. Um, and then we also need this period for system time statement where we define what two date time fields we have. Doesn't matter what those date time fields are called, but here I'm going to call them sys start time and sys end time. Um, we also want to add this system versioning equals on property um, in order to identify that this is a temporal table. Um, in this case, I'm providing a name for my uh, historical table, which is car inventory history. Um, you could also let SQL Server create its own name, but it's really ugly and gross. So I rather I like defining them myself. So if we run this, we should create our table. And if we scroll down here and actually take a look at our table, we will see so I'm querying car inventory and car inventory history. Both the tables look exactly the same and there's no data in them yet. So since we don't have any data yet, let's fill it with some. I'm going to insert these two cars, um, I guess America's car rental agency cars of choice, some Chevy Malibus. Uh, at least that's what it seems like I always get whenever I go run a car. Um, We'll insert those into our car inventory table. And if we go and check our two results again, we will see our top table, which is our temporal table, uh, has our two rows that we just inserted. Um, the timestamps were kept track of in the sys start time, sys end time columns. And we have our data here. We got a black Malibu and a silver Malibu. They both brand new cars, zero miles are driven on them and they are both out in our parking lot. So I've got this uh, in-lot indicator indicating whether the car is here at the rental agency or if it's been rented out by a customer. And so our historical table has no data in it, and that's because that will only get updated after the data in our primary temporal table changes. So we'll see that in a minute. So if we go ahead and take a look uh, what happens if we rent two cars, right? So I'm going to update my car inventory table. I'm setting my in-lot indicator to zero, meaning it's no longer in the lot. Customer has rented it. Um, so if we run that update and we go take a look at our car inventory and car inventory history tables again, even though we only updated car inventory, we now see both of these tables are populated. Car inventory has our most current set of data where in-lot is zero. Um, and it automatically has the timestamp of what time that data changed to that value. And our historical table has the previous version of what that data looked like. So um, before our current table got updated with that in lot equals zero value, um, SQL Server went and took those existing 
previous values and inserted them into the historical table. And now our timestamps, you'll also notice, so like in our, in our primary uh, temporal table here, our system end time timestamps are the maximum of date time two um, because they are still currently active in our current table. As soon as these rows get moved into our historical table, the sys end time column gets populated with what time those, uh, those values were updated. So that's going to be really important when we come to query that data in a little bit. But for now, our cars are rented. We're making money. Um, the next day, we get our, uh, our cars back here. So our in-lot indicator is going to set back to 1, and we have some mileage that also gets set. So if we go and uh, take a look at our tables here one more time, our current data in our temporal table on the top now once again reflects that our cars are back in our parking lot. And, you know, since the customers drove the cars for a little while, the mileage on the odometers has increased. Our historical table has kept track of, uh, of when the cars were out being rented by customers. So we have that data and the timestamps of when that data existed in our main temporal table. So now let's, um, let's rent the car again, right? So we're going to rent out our car ID number two here. And we'll see, now we should only see one uh, new row in our historical table at the bottom. Yes, so um, this previous state of the car being in our parking lot is now in our historical table because currently that silver Malibu has been rented out. And uh, things are good, money's coming in the business. Unfortunately, someone crashes the car, our customer crashed their car. Uh, fortunately, nothing happened to them, but... Uh, can't say the same about our profit margins after we just totaled this brand new car. So if we uh, if we indicate the car wreck by deleting the car from our inventory, right? We no longer have that car is completely totaled. We'll go ahead and delete that. And if we take a look at what our table looks like now, we'll see our current uh, temporal table of car inventory here now only has one record in it. Only our black Malibu has survived, um, and we received a new row into our historical table um, of when we deleted that silver Malibu. So that's kind of how temporal tables work. Um, SQL Server automatically keeps track of all those insert updates and deletes for us using the historical table. That's a great time saving in and of itself because you no longer have to write stored procedures and triggers to keep track of that logic for you if you were to implement that type of uh, logic yourself. It also means you don't have to track that kind of logic in your application, right? Same thing. So where the real benefit of this, though, is, I think, is when you go to query the table. So now, you know, if we want to query back to and see what our data looked like at a certain point in time, um, we can do that really easily with these temporal tables and specifically with this for system time as of uh, statement here. So what we're going to do is we're going to want to look at what the data looked like before the final time that our Silver Malibu was rented and then crashed. Um, so if I look at the timestamp here, the data looked like that at, uh, at this 1.01 a.m. timestamp. And these are UTC timestamps. So we're just going to take that here. So I already pasted that in right there. And so we'll just make it you know, a second after that because we want to see what the data looked like at that moment in time. If we run that query, we'll see this is what our data looked like at this point in time. Both of our cars are in their parking lots, or in our parking lot. Um, you know, the mileage has increased after our first customers have driven them, but the Malibu, the silver Malibu, hasn't been rented out to our second customer who then crashed it. So um, that is one way to look at how the data looked like at a certain point in time. Now, there's a few other different ways of querying that data um, with temporal tables, but you don't need to use any kind of special uh, properties like for system time as of. If you do want to query these tables, you could just query them directly. Um, and so here, for example, I did a right join uh, with car inventory and car inventory history to see what cars had been deleted. Um, so if I run this query here, we can easily see, oh, the car ID of two is the one that was deleted because I'm just filtering on where my car ID is null, right? Basic join query. So you can use the new temporal table uh, query features to easily see what data looked like at a point in time. You can also just use regular queries to you know, join on and 
and look at these both temporal and historical tables, derive whatever kind of data you need. And that's it. Those are the basics of temporal tables. They're pretty easy in SQL Server, and they definitely make querying data in the past a lot easier. Thanks again for watching. I'm Burt Wagner. Please like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed this video.